Endless Hustle is presented by Eat Clean Bro, a convenient solution to bring you the highest quality chef-prepared meals delivered right to your door. Eat Clean Bro is the contract-free solution for your meal prep needs. Made with all natural ingredients and next-day delivery, every meal feels like you have someone cooking for you right at home. All right, it is going to be an inspirational day on the Endless Hustle as I am joined by one of the most successful and I think brilliant sports executives in the business, Scott O'Neill. Welcome to the show. Congrats on everything with the Sixers because I think you guys are going to the, the championship finals this year. I don't want to jinx it, so don't come over the Zoom and beat me up. But uh, <laughs> And also you guys are going through a pretty cool rebuild with the Devils, but you are the president of HSB. You have this wonderful new book out, Be Where Your Feet Are. And uh, I actually read it, which I rarely read the books, but I wanted to see what you had to say. And I thought it was really on the mark. So let's talk all about everything, my man. Let's do it. You know what they say? You can take the boy out of Philly, but you can't take Philly out of the boy. I knew you were going to read it. Dig in. Let's go. I love uh, it, dude. I mean, here's the thing. You. you are this uber successful sports executive. You've got one of the best basketball teams on the planet. But what really struck me, and you talk a lot about this in the book, is you've gone through struggle and loss. And I'm a huge believer as a kid who grew up on welfare, a kid who had to fight for everything in his life. It molds us, it makes us stronger, and it makes us more driven. And you're a perfect example of that. I'm a food stamps kid too, man. That builds character if you can get out of there. Uh, good for you. Yeah, I, I, I will say like, the, my one big life lesson is that life is messy. And, um, and that's where all the learning is. That's where all the people are. You know, you, you, um, you get up to the top of the, whatever the so-called mountain is, and you look back. First of all, it's lonely up there. Secondly, you look back and you think about the incredible journey. You think about the people who helped you along the way. You think about every time you tripped and fell and, and twisted your ankle and fell into a hole or, or tripped over a rock and, you know, that's where I learned everything. Um, and you, you have this vision when you're a kid of just going straight to the moon. And it's a great vision. It's a great dream. It's just not reality. It's like you think it's going to be this linear run. And, um, and boy, I, um, you know, I look, I, I love chasing other mountains to climb for sure. But, but as I've gotten older, I truly appreciate the, the, the guts and messiness of life. And I want it to be okay for people to fail. And I want them to, to look past this, like, I don't want to be too disparaging, but like this fake image that we put out there on Instagram and Facebook. And I, it's not that I don't love seeing your trip to Cabo. Good for you. Honestly, like good for you. And, and, or your kid got into Yale, like mine didn't, you know, and never will. Or, or the kid scored the winning goal. That's not my kid either. But like, I, I love seeing, I really do. I love getting caught up on friends and family and good things happening. I just don't want people to think that's real life. Cause it's not. Um, and I want someone who loses a job or gets fired or runs a company to the ground or has a miscarriage or goes into depression or best friend takes his own life. I want them to know that it's okay. By the way, every single thing I just mentioned happened to me. Had problems at home. Yes, check. And so if you're going through that and you're reading this or you're listening to this, I want you to know like it's going to be okay. You're just in the eye of your own storm. And like the, the path to the top of however you define success and success is defined by differently, thank goodness, by everybody whether that be success at home or success financially or success in your so-called career or success, you know, with relationships or spiritually, however you define what success looks like, the impact you have in the community. It's like, it's going to be okay. You can get there, you know, keep, keep cutting it out. Yeah. One of the things when I saw that title and I've been fortunate to interview some of the most famous and iconic people on the planet, it's really a pleasure and a privilege but the thing that always strikes me about the Oprahs or the Clooney's or these, these iconic individuals is that when they're in front of you and they're talking to you, they make you feel like you're the only person in the room. And meanwhile, like you have a thousand people trying to get their attention. And when I saw that title, Be Where Your Feet Are, it reminded me of that. It, it's really about be in the moment, embrace it, create that bubble around you. So when you're going through the hectic times, when you're going through all this crazy shit, how do you stay in that moment? I mean, how are you able to focus and just keep the tunnel and the walls around you? First off, you have to be aware. I mean, it takes awareness, right? Secondly, you need perspective. You know, I tell the story in the book of Dave Schaller, uh, who I work with, runs our, our communications, and picking his dad up at a homeless shelter because he had just gone, gotten clean. And him being pissed as a young kid that he had to do it 
pissed that he lived in a trailer park, pissed he had to show up um, and pick his dad up. And when he shows up, he, he's only 10 years old. He looks over and, and there's a woman in a blue duffel bag with three kids about the age of his siblings. And for him at the moment, he's like, huh, she doesn't have a trailer to go back to. She doesn't have a beat up car to drive. She's got, she's out of options. Like, I think we all need some of that perspective in life. I really do. Like, I, I think we need to um, look, look at, at, we need to pull the lens back. I, I just talked about before, like that 15 seconds of fame or that insta famous thing. And like, you got to pull back and get some perspective. Uh, I think that's certainly one. We have to have people in our lives that give us real feedback, like real talk, like people that love us enough to tell us. And whether that's your friend or your partner or somebody at work, a boss, someone who works for you, um, your brother, your mother. Uh, me, mine's my wife. Like I, I, I will say like, <laughs> and it's not pretty sometimes. Like I have to honest with you, like it doesn't feel good. Like I, I we were out um, at a restaurant after COVID, five of my friends were out. We hadn't seen each other in a year. And, you know, after dessert, you know, they're, they are all on their phones. I was like, yo, what are we doing? Seriously, whoa, well, I haven't seen you in a year. What are you checking on your phone? What are you looking for? Well, honestly, like, are you checking scores? Are you checking your email? You te- like, I can't wait an hour until you get home. And my wife hits me on, she hits me on this one. I'll wait. And I feel like such crap. She's like, no, 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 seriously, Scott. If whatever you're doing is more important than this conversation, I'll just wait. I'm like, wah, wah, wah. You know, it's one of those, it doesn't feel great. But you know what? I remember I came home one day, all mad about losing, all like frustrated, pissed. She's like, this ain't going to work. I'm like, what's not going to work? I was like, did you see that game? We lost by 22 points. We got booed for the last quarter of the game. And she's like, yeah, no, I saw the game. And it was bad. But this ain't going to work. And I think like, right, it's not going to work because I have to be a husband. I have to be a dad when I get home. And so what tools am I going to give myself and have so that I can be present with her. And I can, I don't have much time. We don't have much time with our kids. Like, let's call it what it is. It's chaos in the morning, survive in advance, get them out of the house. It's just NCAA tournament time. Like, let's just hope we don't have a total meltdown. And then I'm at work there at school. They got homework, boyfriends, I don't, which I don't want to talk about. And they got <laughs> uh, cheerleading and basketball, whatever else they have. And then I got what, an hour with them? How do you want to spend that hour? How do I want to spend this time with you? Do I, do you want me to check? Could you imagine if you were checking your text right now? How terrible of a host would you be? Like, how terrible of a guest would I be? What if I'm watching TV? Because this is how we go through life, right? We watch TV, we have our laptop out, and we have our phone out. We're three screening at the time. How effective a conversationalist are we at home? How about at work? How many times are we trying to do four things at once at work? It doesn't, our brains don't work like that. And so to answer your question, I think we need perspective. I think we need real-time feedback. I think we need commitment. Like we have to understand who we are and who we want to be and what's at stake. And there's a lot of stake right now. I remember because you and I were joking before we got started. I'm originally from Philly. So, and my whole family's still there on the main line in Northeast Philadelphia. So I monitor everything going on with the sports teams, even though I'm a lifelong Lakers fan. But I remember when you guys bring Hinky in and the whole process begins. And I'm like, these guys are genius. Like start it. Nobody wants a middling team for the next 10 years. That's right. Uh, knock it down, build it from the ground up, have a bunch of years of suck, and then go find a Joel Embiid and a Ben Simmons in the draft. And here you guys are potentially knocking on the door of the finals. It all worked out or hopefully will work out and it's wonderful. But I remember in the beginning years of the process, you guys have an empty arena. People think, and you're getting from all angles that you might be the biggest idiots on the planet. When you're going through something like that and you you talk about this in your book, long-term vision, believe in where you want to end up. But when you're going through the, the troughs of that, that beginning where people think you might be an idiot, how do you process that? How are you able to really conceptualize, hey, we know where we want to end up, but just because you may not share our vision doesn't mean we're wrong. How do you get through that? Well, I will tell you, when, when I walked in the door, we just made what's arguably the worst trade in NBA history for Andrew Bynum, who former Laker who never played a game. Um, and we were decimated. I'm um, so on the court, we had two first round draft picks in the next five years. Our team was at the cap and middling at best. It'd be aspirational to call that a middling team. We hadn't won 50 games since Allen Iverson season after he went to the finals. So this was a, you know, this is a decade plus run of 36 wins, which was the average um, on the business side. We were last in the league in season tickets, last in the league in sponsorship revenue, 
any measure of brand affinity, ratings, any of the brand, social media, we were in the bottom five in the league. So anything we measure, what we call KPIs, we were at the bottom. Like there wasn't, you know, I mean, my dad called me when I got the job. He said, son, even you can't fall for this floor. You know, so it was one of those. So I, you know, I heard all the criticism and like, we couldn't get any worse. Um, however, it got, it got really, really choppy. I mean, it was, you know, I've, the, the one year when we won 10 games, I told my wife and kids, like, don't come to any more games. It's, it's, it's too much. Like what people were screaming at me during the games was rough. What, what's, what was written about me personally, I'm just talking about me personally, not the team, but personally on social media was unconscionable. I mean, you want to go on, just Google Scott O'Neill Reddit. You know, you'll have a, you'll have a dream. It's going to be a dream read. And, um, and it was hard, like at home, um, like a 23 year old student aide at school. My daughter's school is giving me a hard time. Like seriously, you know, um, grocery store, you know, and, and look, I was the front of the team. I'm not the front of the team anymore. Like I was the front man of the team. So I was out everywhere kind of slinging the goods. And, um, and so the question is, is how, well, Brett Brown, is a wonderful, wonderful soul. Sam Hickey, wonderful soul. Um, and working for Josh and David, Josh Harris and David Blitzer, like we all helped each other out because there were times when I wanted to take my car and drive it off the freaking bridge, you know, or didn't want to go to work or didn't want to go to another game. Like it was, it was brutal. Um, and so we helped each other. And so like, it goes back to that notion of connection, something we really missed during the pandemic. It's like, like we need each other. We need people. We need, you know, you know, Brett, I remember one game, it was the last game of one of the seasons, and he, he just went nuts in one of his press conferences, just not nuts, but he just said things like, I can't deal with this band of gypsies, you know, blah, 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 blah. So now I, I would go see him after most games, and I went in the same, I said, hey, coach, you need a hug? You okay? He's like, I'm sorry, Scott, I just got frustrated. I was like, coach, it's the last game of the season. Like, if you're trying to send a message, like, send it in here. Like, we can tackle this, like, you know. But he just had a moment. And like I had plenty of moments. You know, we all did. And so having a, a group of people who are committed together is more than than being solo, being a solo artist for sure. And so that, that was that was the greatest help. And then that vision just to say, like, don't we want to do something great? Like, how many times in life can you truly do something extraordinary? That was extraordinary, like what we did. Um, and uh, and to get through it together, uh, it was it's something I'll never forget. And the, the organization, I mean, I'm just, I have this incredible source of pride, not like the false sense of pride, but like that I'm proud of the group they got through. If you would have walked in our office in that 10 win season, you would have cracked. I mean, you would not have recognized it because it was fun. We all believed. We were all the zealots. Like we were walking around quoting Sam Hinkie. If you want to go to the moon, you don't bring a ladder, you know? There are no shortcuts to the, to the middle, you know, to the top, only to the middle. You know, like we, we, were, we were all in. The kids that we had, we hired 20, 100, 20 year old kids, sales, like they would sell something. They'd go out, ring a bell with a big hammer. They would hop up on their desk and they'd each have their own song that they would play and dance around to. Like it was, it was a party. It was because we were together. And then in my business where, you know, on the, when I was with the Knicks, we had Linsanity. It was so fun. That's called, I just call it a movement. Like other teams, they have like marketing slogans or a marketing phrase or mark. Not nah, man, I like movements and movements, the fan zone. And by the way, there's some risk when the fans own the movements. And, and at the team, you amplify, right? You give tools, you, you send out me, like we, we did all the stuff, all the groundwork, all the behind the scenes stuff. We were, we were really active in. But, um, but man, when, when you walk into like a restaurant in Shanghai and the Sixers tea, like I'm always wearing, and you hear, trust the process, or you're walking through South London, going to a football game over there, and someone's like, trust the process, and I'm like, you know, give them the fist up. I mean, it's, a, it's pretty funny. I mean, it's, it's encouraging. It feels good. It feels like what you're doing, that climb is worth it, like the dig is worth it. And, um, and I've never found anything in life where, where you don't, you, that's worth it, that you don't have to work unreasonably hard, and there's not tremendous risk. And, and both of them had that. Now, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that time for anything in the world. I learned more. I became a better human being. I became tougher, stronger, faster. I became much better at like understanding the business and how to grow a business and branding, but I don't want to do it again. You mentioned Iverson and growing up during the Iverson era in Philadelphia, 
only true Philadelphians can understand what that dude means to that city because he he defined everything fun and crazy and sometimes off the wall, but yet the work ethic and toughness of everything Philadelphia is. And one of, one of the things that I really love about what you guys are doing is you embrace him fully. You have him come back and ring the bell. You have yeah, him yeah. front row and you really embrace the Iverson legacy. So getting to be a part of that, what do you believe that he means to that city and was there this conscious choice to really embrace the past of what he represented for the NBA and for the Sixers? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I'm in Atlanta with the Hawks now, and I look up, and they have some great names up on their, you know, their retired jersey, Bob Pettit and Pete Maravich and Dominique Wilkins. I mean, they're all good names. I mean, like the Sixers, it's like Wilt Chamberlain. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's Dr. J. Moses Malone, Charles Barkley, Allen Iverson, like it's Bobby Jones, like it's pretty wild. Like Hal Greer, I mean, we literally have the some of the greatest players of all time. Like it's so big that it's their one name stars. You know, you go Wilt, Sir Charles, AI. They're not a person in the basketball world doesn't know who they are. I mean that that is. I mean, so so we're we're blessed to stand on the shoulders of giants. I, Iverson, um. I mean, he is Philly. That's what he is. He is, I know he was from, from Virginia, Hampton, Virginia, but like there is no more Philadelphia player than Allen Iverson, and there never will be. He is, the, the closest thing I saw was Mark Messier walking through New York um, or Bono walking through MSG. Those, those are the only two people that in my, um, in my experience have rivaled the reaction, like the, throw rose petals at his feet, like be gasping because you can't talk because it's so special um, because he represents all of us in our best and worst. Um, his, his passion, his energy, how he shows up every day, every game, how much he loves the energy in the crowd, how much he, he walks the streets. He's a modern day Rocky Balboa. That's what he is. I mean, that is what he is in his core. And I love, I love him. I love him as a human being. I love his, his passion. I love his battle. I love his struggle. I love the man he wants to be and the man he is. Like I, I, I cannot say enough about him. I, I root for him more than I root for uh, most people in the world. And by the way, arguably the most influential and respected by all the NBA players. And it's funny because I just had Tim Grover on the show, Kobe and Michael Jordan's longtime trainer. And he was saying that no matter who you talk to, the name that always gets brought up is AI. AI, the tattoos, he changed the fashion. He changed the way players walked, carried themselves, everything. Even probably more than MJ, probably the most influential for a generation of players. Right. Well, remember Michael Jordan said famously or infamously, hey, even Republicans buy shoes, yep. right? And Allen Iverson was very different. I, I, I don't mean him, him making political statements. But he, he, he came to the world very much like Be Where Your Feet Are says. is like, find your authentic self and be your authentic self. And that, that is, by the way, I think that's the secret to leadership right now with, with Gen Zs and millennials, more Gen Zs. But like they sniff you out in two minutes. You fake, you're phony, you're not real. Like here's what they want. They want access. They want transparency. They want... They want um, a mission to believe in something bigger than the mundane job they have. They'll work hard. They're smarter. They have better brand. But like, hey, you show up not as you are. They'll walk out the door. There's no social. Con the social contract is I'm going to work here until I don't want to anymore. I might have a job. I might not. It's not like when I was growing up, like I would never leave a job without another job. It terrified me. They're like, eh, I'll figure it out. Like it's. And so, man, if, if you can learn one thing from Alan Iverson, it's like figure out who you are and be that person. I used to have this t-shirt that said, um, be yourself because everyone else is already taken. And I love that notion. And when you're young, you're looking for other people to take pieces, right? I mean, that's the only way we become who we are. It's a collection of our experiences. It's the people we connect with and, and, and who we aspire to be. But who, you, who are you at your like core, authentic self? Iverson knew that coming out of the womb. And he never, never ventured. By the way, he took care of dozens of families families like this was a guy who he he kept his core he kept his core friends he 
man, I, I will say I have time for him. And, uh, and yes, he's, he was part of this organization and, and will be for a long time. Here's the thing that strikes me. This is the first time we've ever spoken. And you're, you'd mentioned the word authenticity. You're one of us. You're a 51 year old dude. You're like a great dude. I could tell that, forget an interview. If I met you at a bar, I'd be like, this is the guy I want to grab drinks with. And when we think of corporate America, you're not the guy we think of. And it also, <laughs> but it also shows you how much, like you'd mentioned, corporate America has changed. I mean, you people want to work for dudes and dudettes and just real people. The way you talked about Brett Brown and even Hinky, I can't even imagine. I, I can see you became friends with them. How hard it must have been to let them go, especially yeah, knowing that I can't even imagine the bullets that they had to take as you guys yeah. were building this thing. How do you, when you become and build friendships with these people and also know what they have to go through while you're building something, how hard is it to separate the friendship from the, hey, I still have to be the president of HSB? Yeah, that's a great question. Or HBS, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I, I will say that letting people go is the hardest thing you ever have to do. Um, and I will tell you, like, like my reputation in the business is that culture and people and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I'm about. But I just, sometimes people confuse that with soft, being soft. And I, there are only 12 people here from when I got here. 12. Can you imagine that? No. 12 people in my organization are still here. And, and some of them opted out because they, they didn't want to go on the journey or run. And some of them opted out because it didn't fit. And some of them we moved out. And, um, and I will say that I'll just say first, just my philosophy on, on people is that the world is small and life is long. Okay. And I, I generally love people. I, I once uh, infamously uh, let somebody go at, at Madison Square Garden and I broke down in tears firing this guy. He's like a big time executive still in, in another big time job. And he's saying, Scott, it's okay. Can you imagine that? And he had been here 18 years. Scott, you're okay. It's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. And so I feel, I feel hard. Like I feel for people. I feel it because I've been fired. You know, I've been out of work. I've gotten foreclosure notices on my house. I know how hard it is to, to, to be out of work with no money. Like, you know, I don't have that problem anymore, but I know what it's like. I still have that feeling and I feel so hard. And I remember, uh, you know, the same, going back to this one guy and then I'll, I'll tackle the, the one question is I helped him quite a bit get his next job. Okay. Which was a big job. And then he got a much bigger job after that. And by the way, there hasn't been a year where we haven't exchanged holiday cards. And this guy fired. And why is that? It's because I'm like, I think that we need to see people as people and we have to walk in their shoes and we can't be cold hearted and rough. And we have to understand that the world is connected and, and whether that will come back uh, to me again directly, or he's just going to pass it on and pass those lessons on to the thousands of people he's been able to impact. That's what I'm interested in. It's like that connection and those people and you know what? Has it been hard? Am I like the fall guy sometimes uh, for the organization when someone has to go? Of course, that's my job. It's okay. I understand my role. I have to make tough decisions. Some of them I don't make. Some of them I don't make and I have to deliver. Some of them I make and don't deliver. And I understand that role and why it works and why it doesn't work. Um, but I, I, man, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit nostalgic. I love people. And I don't, one of my biggest disappointments was that we, we, we wrecked careers, wrecked careers in this process. Some players, some executives, some coaches wrecked them. And that's, that's I don't have any source of, okay, I, it's not okay with me. I don't, I'm not going to recover from that. I'm not going to like brush that under the rug. It stinks. Now we made careers too. We made careers on the court and we made careers for coaches and staff as well. But, but it, it, I think it was, it was the most volatile situation and volatility drives a lot of action. And some of that action is really good. And some of it's really, really bad. Brett Brown, I would do anything that guy anytime. He called me and literally said, hey, my son's playing in Maine. Can you drive me up there? I would drop what I'm doing and drive him up. I, I, I have time for him. He gave his heart and soul to this organization. Yep. And Sam Hinkie, you know, he's in, in the Valley now. He's got a, a venture capital firm. We just invested in a, in a company together, our, uh, HBSE and, and, uh, and Sam. And, um, and we, we connected conferences and stuff. I, I have time for him. And hopefully that's time for me. Like I, we see, we hug, we talk, um, but it's, 
it's oh, it's hard. This stuff is hard. It's so personal. And I, I love both of them. And I, I say that in like a pure, I know I, not many people use the word love when you say corporate world. And, um, and I do because I truly love both of them. I would do anything, anytime for them. You got to be mentored by the greatest commissioner in sports history. I interviewed him once on a red carpet and was totally geeking out over David Stern because as a guy who grew up loving Magic Johnston, I know, and I've seen the phases of the NBA from MJ to Larry and, and Magic. And then obviously we see the AI, Kobe, and now the era we're seeing with LeBron and now Giannis and the next generation. He built all that almost single-handedly and he had the vision. So when you get to work with a guy like that, what's he really like behind the scenes? Obviously we know how brilliant he was building, but what was he like? Cause I've heard so many stories about the humor and the comments and just the fun shit. Was he everything I hope I've heard about him? I don't know what you heard, but uh, I was a young man when I worked for him. So I, I was 29. I worked for him for almost eight years. And by the way, on the commissioner point, I think Adam Silver is going to go down as, as the greatest of all time. But, but that's a whole other story for another day. Um, but, but David redefined what it meant to be a commissioner. And he changed and shaped the world. Not only the world of basketball, but he changed and shaped the world. Um, how do I describe him? He was brilliant. I mean, beyond brilliant. He was intellectually curious. We'd get on a plane and he would read nine inches of articles on life sciences and technology and geopolitical stuff. I mean, business and sports was like he already knew it. But everything else, um, he had a line out his door of senators and world leaders and religious leaders that would come see him. He, he was accessible, like to me, as a 29-year-old kid who thought he knew everything. Um, he, you know, he changed the, na the narrative on HIV through Magic Johnson. Like, think about that. Like, him. Because he did the work. He, he knew what was happening. And so when one of our players contracted HIV, it was David Stern that partnered with Magic Johnson and said, like, it's okay, let's go do this together. Like, he was the one who brought the power of community and changing the world through sports and impact to the world. He's the one who, like, embraced players. And, like, this is your platform. This is your social platform. Go drive change. I mean, there, there's, there's a – I mean, he set up an office in China in the 80s. I mean, like, it's – He's so far ahead. It's insane. And I, I, I love, love, love him. I loved working for him. I loved learning from him. He was, he was rough though. I mean, he was, he was old school, yep. screaming your face, tell you things that were so nasty. Like you almost couldn't believe someone would say to you as a human being. Uh, I saw people cry in meetings. I, I literally, I, I've never seen anyone talk to anybody that way. I mean, think of the worst coach you had growing up, the worst, the meanest, worst guy that was screaming in your face, and you multiply that by 100, that was him. And But it was purposeful, and he could go from zero to 60 in two seconds and then back again. He had this ability to, like, just make you want to be the best version of yourself. You, you wanted to prove to him that you could do it at his level. He had an elite gear, an elite mind, and he believed in management by fear and intimidation. Like he was the Bobby Knight of executives. I mean, and no doubt, and not too far off. And um, and I, I smile because I, you know, hopefully you hear that in my voice. Like I, and it was, I mean, when 8,300, I'll never forget his extension. His ex I know his extension, okay? <laughs> I've worked for him in 20 years. God rest his soul. And I would see that and my heart rate would start pounding and the heat would rise from my heart all the way at the top of my head. And I would be like, holy crap, what is he going to yell at me for today? You know, <laughs> I remember I got off the pl plane once in Detroit and uh, phone rang and it was like, you son of a mother, F -da -da! you know, and I was like, mom, and he lost his mind. Okay. You know who this is? This is your boss, you know? get back to New York right now. I was like, well, I just, let, I'm in, it hung up. I was like, do I just get on the plane and go back to New York? You know, it was like, and so, and I went, I left, but like, um, I mean, I remember, and he would try to separate people. You know, he, he, what, what did he call it? Um, episodic micromanagement. That's what he used to call it. It's a great phrase, right? 
So, and he, he believed in episodic micromanagement, meaning like if anything was going wrong, he was going 50 layers deep. And he would keep asking you questions until you couldn't answer them anymore because it was impossible to know that level of detail. And um, I remember we were at this, this meeting once and uh, Ski Austin was a long time head of events and we forgot the name tags, whatever, which I understand. Like he's the commissioner. He wants to know who everybody is because it's embarrassing if he doesn't know John from Orlando, you know? And man, he put us right next to each other and he's screaming back and forth, whose fault is it? You know, and uh, it's Ski and I are looking at each other. I said, well, it's both of us. He's like, I didn't ask you, shut your mouth. You know, like that kind of, you know? And uh, we got through that problem. But, um, but there were, it was all, I mean, it was, it was an education in life. And, um, and I'll just I have to, I have to add this. I had some, some things happen in my family, unfortunately, um, that, that weren't very positive. Um, one I've, I've, I've said before, and it was medical and he was my first call. He called me. I had no idea how he, who told him or how it, it was just really private between me and my wife. And he called me and he offered to roll into literally the best experts in the world checked up on me five times in a month wow. like that that was david stern i mean i had this other instance where i've never told the story before um and I, i'll definitely like get emotional telling this so i'm even hesitating telling you but i'm gonna go for it is my dad um who was a tremendous incredible leader just fell off the map um emotionally and spiritually and physically and uh his mind and um and was struggling and he somehow like cold called David Stern using my name to get in there to kind of like sell him business, you know, as a, he was a, in his heyday, he was a leadership development consultant, a trainer, and one of the best, I mean, Xerox, McDonald's, ADP, Texco around the world. He had built like this incredible reputation and then he just fell off. He just, you know, he had some things happen that didn't go well and he just became a shell of himself. It's really sad. And, uh, and Stern spent apparently two hours with my dad. And I didn't know. I, I didn't know he was there. But I was in the office. But, and then one of my friends tipped me off, said, hey, I saw your dad. I was like, what? And so I called his assistant, Linda, and I said, hey, was my, was my dad here? And and that So, so I went up there so anyway I went up there and I was like hey I'm sorry and he just said he's like it's your dad But that was him. And, um, you know, that's like, that is, there's no, nobody like him. Never will be. That was awesome, uh, so, dude. That was so awesome, man. I, I have no words to describe that. Like, here you are. Like, this is why you're, like, going to be, like, my favorite dude ever. Like, you're running a basketball team and a hockey team. And the fact that you can be in the moment and let your emotions take over like that is just fucking awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, no, thank you. But, but that was David Stern. It's like, can you imagine like him taking two hours with a guy who he knew didn't have it together? Um, but he didn't want to embarrass him. Um, he didn't want to embarrass me. And that, that is like elite, an elite man that I would have, I, I would have run through a wall for him. That's so cool, man. What a, see, that's the stuff. So pretty much you did verify everything I heard about David, but also <laughs> the good, and, the good and the crazy. And that's kind of what made Stern Stern. But the funny thing is you look at Silver and it feels like he's the complete opposite end of the spectrum. He's like the new age leader. <laughs> yes. No, and he was like Adam relationships. Like he, like the relationships with players, like he's, he's texting with players all the time. Like he, the relationship with the union, the relationship with the media execs, like he, boy, man, 
and his his awareness on social issues, like what he did with the Clippers to transform Sterling out and Bomber in. I mean, I don't know if anybody would have the guts, any commissioner in history would have the guts to do that. Um, I think he's, man, he understands business and he's a producer at heart. So he understands how everything looks and why everything looks the way it, it does and how it can look. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's, he is brilliant and wonderful and is changing the world. Like think of the Africa league. Think of what he's done with China and elevating that another level. Like, I, I don't think we're, we barely scratched the surface into what he's going to accomplish. For you, you know, trust the process is great now because you guys are seeing the success and it's paid off and you can pretty much say, hey, we told you so to a certain degree. What was the moment for you through trust the process where you began to see the turn where maybe you're in the arena, Joel is now becoming Joel, Simmons become like, was there a moment for you where you're kind of standing there and you're like, holy shit, it's starting to work out finally. The. Yeah, I remember it was draft lottery when we got Ben Simmons. That was it. That was the moment. That was the moment that I knew we were, were good. We had Joel. I saw Joel play. I, was, I remember I was staying next to Brett Brown, and I was like, holy crap. He's like, he's the most skilled big man I've ever seen. I'm like, I've never seen anything like And he was young. He was still raw and young. He's not like he is today, where he's the most dominant player in the league. But I, I mean, you know, and then we needed a we needed a wingman, and and that lottery, that pick, that I have a video of our staff. I was in New York uh, at the thing, at the event, and I, I have a picture of our staff, and they lost her. It's the best video. I, I I keep it because it's so special, and it shows how like it was everybody on edge and working so hard, and all of a sudden they released this incredible celebration. And at that moment, I knew all the crap, all the mud we've been dragged through, all the heartache, all the sleepless nights, all the drama, all worth it. This play, we were going right to the moon. By the way, I agree with you with Embiid. There's never been anyone like him. I never thought we'd see someone like Olajuwon. He's an evolved version of him. He's Shaq and yeah. Olajuwon combined. It's ex By the way, I've never heard that, and that's exactly right. Um, a young Shaq. Yeah, because a, a young a shack, skinny shack, a mobile shack, right? Yeah, yeah. Before he got overpowering at, shack and became like, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you, shack, right? I, right, like, right, right. I mean, before, like, and it's, it'd be interesting, but I remember when I was working for the Nets my first year in, in the NBA, shack ripped down the basket, like, not the rim, he ripped the basket down, the basket stanchion, which is probably like, I don't know, can withstand 5,000 pounds of force or something, something ridiculous. And it was like, it was back before they had a third basket. They had to go, go out and get a basket. It was like, took like an hour delay. He, and I was like 30 feet away. And I was like, holy. And I was so young in the league. I was 22 years old. I'm like, is this how this league is? I mean, the people rip baskets now. I was like, so insane. And every night I watch Joel Embiid, I think like, I see something I've never seen before. And how many players do you ever get that? It doesn't mean like, like I remember the Michael Jordan era and he did spectacular things. I've never seen anything like this guy. Never. There's, there's never, I've never seen anyone. I'm not a big fan of the NBA today in terms of they can't touch each other. I love nineties and eighties physicality. I've never seen a guy that does what he does from three point well, shooting to footwork to touch mid range touch. The guy doesn't miss if it's 17 feet and in, I don't think yeah, I've yeah. ever seen Joel Embiid. And now that he's put the mindset into it and he's, yeah. he wants to dominate. The guy has a chance to be a top 15, top 10 player when all is said and done of all yeah. time. And I, I agree. And he's got like 15 moves. I mean, like Kobe from your beloved Lakers brought in a new move every year. I think Joel brings like three or four. Like he does things. I'm like, is he practicing this? And then his, his uh, longtime coach, Drew Hanlon, actually posted a video of him practicing and then, and, then, uh, and then doing the move in the game, which I love seeing that um, because – you know, with kids, it's like if you watch AU basketball, it's like kids think you just come out on the court and do what he does or do what any of these guys do. And, like, what, what we miss as fans or as kids is how hard they were. Like, everyone's big. Everyone's athletic. It's like Kobe Bryant took 2,000 shots a day in the offseason. A day. It's like you want to be great at anything? Like, dig in and work. Like, you know, you have to work on reasonably hard to, be, to accomplish anything. And, uh, and Joel is clearly putting in the work because he is a monster.
So the reason that we started this show, Scott, was to talk to successful people like you about how they're able from a mindset and work standpoint to achieve the success they, they achieve. So my question to you, Scott O'Neill, is how do you continue to elevate both on and off the court? Me personally, um, I'm older now, you know, um, I, I guess I'm going through my own version of midlife crisis. So, uh, so, so what I, my, my formula is really simple for success. It's work unreasonably hard, um, be intellectually curious and be an extraordinary teammate. That's my formula. It's been my formula since I was 14 years old and hopefully will be my formula forever. As I get older, however, I just want to add one more dimension to that. And that's to understand the connectedness in the world and the connectedness of people and the importance of um, helping others. And I, and, and I don't mean that from a service end, although I'm, I'm, I'm very well versed in, in how to serve others. But I, as a 22 year old young man, I, the guy that sat next to me in our little crappy cube and our little crappy jobs is now running CAA Sports, one of the biggest sports and entertainment um, representation firms. Like, and the guy to my left in his little crappy office, he's an office a couple years older, is Brett Yormark is running Rock Nation's business. And so I think that's lost today. I, what I say to young team, my young teams as they come in in, in new ways, I, I speak to groups of 12 when they come in. And I would say, look to your left and look to your right. We've got 2,000 people here. We've got 500 full-time people here. Most of you are under 26 years old. Can you imagine if you just spent time helping others and being an extraordinary teammate and connecting with people on a personal level that you cared about them personally. Can you imagine what your life looks like in five years, 10 years, 20 years? Because now your friends are running the world. They're literally in the sports entertainment world. They will be running businesses and they're your friends. And so think about how easy deals are. Think about how fun life is. Think about if you want to go to a show or a game anywhere in the world. You just say, Hey buddy, remember me? And it's like, we need to do more of it. We need to like invest in people and not in a Machiavellian way, not in the, because I get the outcome of X, but in a way like, let me be a good human being. Let me connect with people. Let me help serve others. And if that is your pure intent, I promise you, you will have the best run in any business, in any industry, in any country that you could possibly dream. Dude, this was awesome. Now that the Lakers are out, I want to see you guys actually Let's go. Win. Jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. There's room. No, I do because I remember when the Eagles won and what it did for the city and my whole family's there. And I know if you guys win and the way this team has become beloved in that city, I think it'll just tear the roof off of Philly. And I do love to see good things happen to Philly, even though I live in New York full time. Um, I love seeing good things happen to Philly. And I think what you guys, I also think what you guys did with the process was really a model for not just building a sports team, but building any business break it all down, start from the ground up and let's go through the shit together and make it happen. And, and life too. And, and life, life, brother. It's a metaphor. Look at that. Yes. Trust the process. Agreed. So congrats on the book, man. Fantastic read. Be where your feet are. And this has been a blast, man. Thank you for a fun interview. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Take care.